Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the ELEX webinar on Research Data Discovery, Developing a Data Catalog. I am Miriam Nauenberg, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Megan Delbagliveau, Patricia Heingardner, and Na Lin. Megan Delbagliveau has over 25 years of experience as an academic librarian working in a variety of technical services positions. She began her tenure at the Health Sciences and Human Services Library as the Serials Cataloger in September 1999. Currently the Serials Metadata Librarian, her responsibilities have expanded to include curating resources in the UMB Digital Archive and creating the records for the UMB Data Catalog. She has co-authored articles published in the Journal of the Medical Library Association and its predecessor, the Bulletin of the Medical Library Association, as well as the Technical Services chapter of Health Sciences Librarianship, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2014. She is a member of NASIG, ALA, the Potomac Technical Processing Librarians, and the Maryland Library Association. Patricia Heingardner is Associate Director for Resources at the Health Sciences and Human Services Library at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, where she provides leadership for the Resources Division, which includes collection strategies and management, resource development and sharing, and metadata management. Patricia has worked at the Health Sciences and Human Services Library for over 30 years, where she has held a variety of positions that have provided her with a broad perspective in librarianship. She has served as a reference librarian, liaison librarian to the School of Nursing, and web manager. Patricia is a member of the Medical Library Association, as well as the Mid-Atlantic Chapter of MLA. She has published articles, presented posters, given presentations, and been active on professional committees. Na Lin, is the Head of Resource Development and Sharing at the Health Sciences and Human Services Library at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. In her 30-year professional career in industries and academia, she has served as systems librarian, principal informationist, and manager. In her current position, she has led and implemented numerous technology solutions for library services. Na is a member of the Mid-Atlantic Chapter of MLA and serves on the membership committee. She has authored published articles, a book chapter, posters, and given presentations. Meg, Patty, and Na bring considerable expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have them with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTSCE. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions pane on your screen. We will have time for questions after the presentation. This, web this webinar is being recorded. You will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, here is Patty. There will be a slight delay while we change presenters. Thank you, Miriam, and welcome everyone. I want to begin by giving you a quick introduction to the University of Maryland, Baltimore, also known as UMB. The university consists of seven schools, including dentistry, law, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, social work, and a graduate school. We have over 2,700 faculty, and over 6,700 students, and 87% of those students are either in professional or graduate programs. So we have a very small undergrad population. And UMB received over $667 million in grants and contracts. So there's lots of research going on at UMB, which generates lots of research data. And as all of you well know, data is everywhere. According to Google, there are many thousands of data repositories on the web providing access to millions of data sets, and they should know because they are beta testing a data set search engine. Even though there are lots of repositories out there, not all data is on the web. Some researchers store data on local area networks, hard drives, and even flash drives. With the current emphasis on data sharing, the question for us was, how do we facilitate the discovery of our institution's research data? How do we make it more findable? 
For us, the answer was to develop an institutional data catalog. We see the catalog as a tool to facilitate the discovery of data sets created or used by UMB researchers. Whether the data resides in a repository scattered around the web or on local devices, we are trying to identify UMB data sets. We also see this as a tool to centralize and highlight what is happening at UMB. We felt that this was important as did the Director of Industry Alliances from our UMB Office of Research and Development. She saw one of our demos and was very excited about the catalog's potential. She saw it as a tool to show industry leaders the type of data being generated at UMB. We also see the tool as a way to promote interdisciplinary collaboration by identifying common research interests not only for collaborations beyond the campus, but also within. Researchers from one of our schools don't necessarily know what's happening at others. So we saw this as a good centralized resource. And finally, we also see it as a way to support the process of data reuse. For all of these reasons, our director decided that this was a project worth pursuing. We applied for and received a $15,000 award from the National Networks of Libraries of Medicine, the Southeastern Atlantic region to implement a catalog. So we want to develop it, but now we need an infrastructure. We had seen demos of NYU's data catalog, catalog and we liked what they'd done. Staff at the Health Sciences Library at NYU had developed open source software and a metadata schema specifically for a data catalog. For us, an open source solution was very doable because we have a very good IT group within the library. So we contacted NYU and began a conversation about implementing their system. And while we were talking with them, so were staff from the Health Sciences Library at the University of Pittsburgh. So the staff at NYU thought it would be a good idea for all of us to collaborate together. So we did, and this was the beginning of the data catalog collaboration project, the DCCP. I'd like to talk just a little bit about this collaboration for a few minutes before we look at the implementation of our own catalog. The DCC, its purpose is to exchange ideas and best practices as we build our data catalogs. We also wanted to be sure that the metadata continue to be standardized and that the development of the software was ongoing. As you can see from the slide, more institutions have joined us. And currently, about five institutions have data catalogs that are up and running on the web. Currently, the organizational structure of the DCCP includes institutional leaders who meet quarterly to provide project updates and talk about any issues of concern. There are also three working groups that include the metadata group, outreach group, and a documentation group. If you would like to see documentation about the catalog and metadata, it is available in the Open Science Framework, and we have the URL listed at the end of the presentation. As far as communication and collaboration, we have a DCC website, we also use Slack for, as a collaboration tool and WebEx for our regular meetings. The group also promotes the DCCP at professional meetings. We have done posters and informational sessions. We are now in the process of developing a new model for the collaboration in order to broaden the research data discovery discussion. It would consist of the core group of uh, institutions using the NYU data catalog software, and, but also include institutions who are just interested in talking about data sharing practices. If you're interested in more about the DCCP or in joining us, you can visit the DCC website and we have that listed at the end of the presentation. So back to the UMB data catalog. I want to talk about the resources we use to develop the catalog. This is the structure that works for us. Other institutions may have more or fewer people involved. Our team has representation from across the library. We have a project lead, 
who manages the project and also does outreach, and that's Nan. She'll be talking to me in a few minutes about outreach. We have a metadata librarian, which is Meg, who creates the uh, catalog records, and she'll be giving a, a tour of the front and back end of the catalog records. Both Na and Meg are in the resources division. From our services division, we have a bioinformationist on the team, which is really great because as he's reaching out to researchers, he promotes the catalog. From our computing and technology division, we have a web developer and a programmer, and then there's a senior advisor who does outreach and promotion, and that's me, and I head up the resources division. So that's our personnel. Our technology, as we mentioned, this is open source software, and it is available on GitHub. The operating system can either be Windows or Linux, and we use a Windows environment here. We've listed the software needed for the database and for indexing. It is a web-based interface. And there is an open sandbox at the University of Pittsburgh. So if you want to go out and play with the system, you can. So we've talked about our team and our technology. Now we need to get researchers on board. And so I'm going to hand it over to Na who talk about research strategies. Thank you, Patty. Now, before I start talking about outreach strategies, I have to state that this is our experience only. Outreach is a very individual and often personal experience in the context of the environment you are in. Each DCCP member institution has its own organizational structure, culture, and the support levels, and consequently their own ways of doing things. But I hope our experience will reflect some common practice among all members. Now let's face it, the main objective of outreach is to acquire data information for the catalog. To do that, like to start any new service, the first thing we did was to recognize and get buy-ins from the stakeholders, which in this case were leadership and their researchers. With them, we adopted a top-down and a bottom-up approach. We reached out to research deans and program directors because if they support it, they will carry the message with more weight to their counterparts and the researchers. We explained the goal and the benefits for the project. They listened, asked a lot of questions, and they expressed support. But not all the questions they asked we could answer at the time, such as, how data should be shared. To understand it better ourselves, we consulted with our institutional review board and the Office of Research and Development, and then created a UMB data sharing process flowchart. This way, we will be able to provide directions for researchers who might have the same question. Another angle to get the support from heads of programs is to do what's good for them. For example, Pharmacy Research Computing Center is looking for customers to use its licensed medical da Medicare data. School of Medicine has a new biorepository to provide the biospecimens and associated medical data for secondary research. We offered that if we catalog these databases, you would open another advertising avenue for their service. They liked the idea and got on board right away. At the same time, we do a retail outreach, if you will, to individual researchers. We started off by leveraging our existing relationships through Digital Archive, which is our institutional repository. In fact, these researchers are the first contributors helping us jumpstart the service. Our bioinformationist, as Patty mentioned before, came from School of Medicine where he had a network of connections he would reach out to. REOs, the research, education, and outreach librarians for each school, often know which faculty members are more receptive to library services. And the reaching out to that group has been very productive. In addition to uh, individual outreach, oops, Sorry. Uh, we also targeted organizations generating massive data. 
for example, epidemiology and the Center for Vaccine Development and the Global Health. Recently, the campus created UMB Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, an interdisciplinary program to provide, to provide researchers with funding, training, and infrastructure. It is a resource for us as well, as it can help us identify research projects and connect us to the principal investigators. And of course, we promote the service through traditional mass communication, such as handouts, social media, and the blogs and newsletters. Now, not all these efforts are not without facing resistance. To make data catalog service work, researchers have to actively, actively participate in uh, data curation with us. This requires them to review the records, provide additional information, figure out where to place the data, and get ready to respond to potential data requests once the information is published. Spending time to do all this on top of their busy schedules is a challenge for them, and therefore it becomes a challenge for us as well. One way to meet this challenge, at least in our capacity, is to provide as much support as we can throughout the process. The good news is that more and more funders now mandate data to be open for access. So we really don't have to lecture PIs on data sharing, but focus on helping them achieve that. To save researchers time, we created a record template for them to either fill out or review the content drafted by metadata librarians. Meg will talk about it later in details. Besides providing consultation on UMB data sharing procedures, as I mentioned before, we also help researchers evaluate the data repository options. To support their manuscript submissions, which often requires links to the data at a time, and in which they always seem in a hurry, we would find a repository for their data sets. To ease their concern about being inundated by data requests through direct contact, we put up a request form asking for identification, research interests, relevant projects, and so on. And Meg will show you the form in a minute. This mechanism will filter out noises and only pass on the serious request to the researcher. And we tailor the form based on individual needs. Going forward, we will work researchers in various stages throughout their research cycle. This will not only spread out the work they need to do with the data catalog, but also make their projects visible as soon as possible. For example, publish records once data collection has completed, and then update them later as the project's progress, including adding more descriptive metadata and article links once the manuscripts have gone in press. Another challenge we face is locating data sets. This university does not have a centralized data repository. Data are everywhere. While getting data information through outreach, we also turn to these three types of data sources. Databases, including citation databases, open access publishers platforms, and the public data repositories. Since many projects are funded here by National Institute of Health that requires open data, we locate the projects and the investigators through NIH reporter. And from there, we search PubMed Central and Scopus, and both of which provide pathfinders to data sets. Open publishers such as PLOS One and Nature Springer require manuscripts uh, be submitted together with data or data locations, so we can get data from there as well. Locating data sets directly from open data repositories like Fixture and BioLink is another way. But since there isn't really a good way to search by institution in those repositories, it is not always as effective. However, once we know individual researchers prefer the repositories, we can search by their names in those places. 
these finding methods have built us a robust pipeline that keeps our metadata librarians busy. Now let's hear from Meg about their data curation process. Thank you, Na. Greetings all. Thank you for your interest in our data catalog project experience. My section of the presentation will cover the functionality and structure of the records and include a little about our workflow. The primary goal is to demonstrate the flexibility of the schema, which is important when describing data sets. As mentioned earlier, NYU developed the schema, which resulted from reviewing metadata from the UCSF Large Dataset Inventory, common metadata across NIH-funded datasets available on Figshare, schemas used by Datasite and Dryad, the World Wide Web Consortium Data Catalog Repository, as well as interviews with NYU researchers. If you're interested in additional details about the record metadata, there is excellent documentation on the Open Science Framework site maintained by NYU. The URL is included in one of the final slides. We've thrown caution to the winds today and we'll be doing a live demo. Consequently, we're hoping that the technology gremlins are otherwise engaged for at least 20 to 25 minutes. So let's get started. You are currently viewing the initial screen of the public end of the data catalog. We're first going to tour the public view to demonstrate some of the features associated with the selection of our records, and then we'll go behind the curtain and tour the back end. The catalog consists of two types of records, internal and external. Internal describe data sets resulting from UMB faculty research. External describe data sets from, a government, from government agencies or large studies that have been used by our faculty for research purposes. So let's take a look at an internal data set record. We chose this record because it's so extensive. As you can see, there's an awful lot of metadata here. So let's start at the top. We have a very prominent title, and under that is author or authors, as the case may be. On the left side of the record are mostly descriptive elements. We provide a fairly robust description of the data set, which includes information about the goal of the study and general details about the research process. Going on down, we have the beginning and ending year of data collection, subject of study, subject domain. These are authoritative vocabulary terms, the majority of which are medical subject headings with some Library of Congress as needed. Population age groups, subject gender, and keywords. These are also mostly MESH or LC, but include non-authoritative when appropriate. These are not the only metadata elements that can appear on this side of the record, just the ones that have values for this particular study. Now for the right side. Dr. Artemis's data has been deposited in the NCBI Geo database, which is freely accessible to anyone. Consequently, clicking on it will open his website in the Geo database. Going down the right side, access restrictions and access restru instructions are text fields for adding details. The article associated with this data set is displayed under associated publications and is also clickable. Equipment and software used all have links to web pages. We'll click on the Illumina HiSeq 2500 here, and there is a data page. You also have study type, data set formats, and data size. And clicking on the blue link under grant support 
we'll open Dr. Othamus's study page in the NIH reporter. Finally, this entry material, which is listed under other resources, and clicking on that will take you to the article with supplementary data sets on the left side. So that's an internal data set. The external data set is very similar. Oops, sorry. Just a few differences. The Osteoarthritis Initiative was a multi-institutional study that lasted for 11 years. The data has been stored on the NIMH Data Archive site. Notice there are no authors, but there is a local expert. Similar to the internal data set we just viewed, the blue button goes directly to the appropriate web page. Notice the details under access restrictions must create a user account and register for access. And this record doesn't have a citation. Instead, there is an embedded PubMed search of articles about studies using data from the OAI. And this is not limited to UMB only. There are also links to other web pages within the OAI website, Data Dictionary, and study protocol and appendices. Both of the records we've just reviewed have linked to outside databases. However, the links behind the blue buttons can accommodate a variety of other methods of access for internal data sets. So let's take a look at one that's slightly more complicated. For several reasons, a researcher may wish to require the submission of an application in order to provide access to a data set. Dr. Chen's cholera vaccine data catalog record is an example, and you'll notice that the blue button has access via application. Under these circumstances, our bioinformationist creates a customized application using Red Hat and provides us with the URL. Someone interested in accessing this particular data set would simply submit his or her completed application and it would be sent along to Dr. Chen for consideration. I also wanna bring your attention to the alternate title and if I hover over Dr. Chen's name in the author section, I can click on view profile and access his profile page, which is on the School of Medicine website. Thus far, we've taken a look at an internal and external record and a record with access via an application. Next, we'll view an example that has characteristics of all three. This record describes a data set maintained by the Pharmaceutical Research Computing Center in our School of Pharmacy's Department of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research. Again, notice no author. However, there is a local expert. Access is via an application, but it's not one of the ones created by our bioinformationist. It was developed by the Computing Center and the Pharmaceutical Health Services Research Department. Additionally, the access restrictions are access is restricted to the University of Maryland institution and affiliates, and the data may only be used for pilot research, work, and study feasibility. The access instructions include the submission of the application, but also a data use agreement and fee payment. Finally, this particular data set is related to two other data sets within the catalog. 
And as we've seen before, they're clickable. Takes you to that record and that record. The majority of blue button links, however, for internal data sets are via author. In these cases, clicking on the blue link produces a blank email template auto-populated with the author's email address. This is accomplished via an HTML script. Also, notice on the left-hand side the detail in the geographic coverage. Again, the metadata assigned is totally dependent upon each individual study. Now that you have some familiarity with the metadata and functionality from the public view side, we'll tour the back end where all of the actual work takes place. On the left side of the screen are six functions. View unpublished data sets. These are records that have been created but not made public yet. Add a new data set provides a blank template for creating a record. Edit an existing data set includes both published and unpublished records. Manage related entities, we'll come back to this one. Manage website users, manage authorizations to work in the back end, and remove a data set. Can delete a record, we've not used this function yet. I'm going to go to Dr. Atomus's transcriptomic data data catalog record so that we can see it from the back end. All metadata fields for both internal and external records are included in a single entry template. So beginning with data set ID, which is a system assigned number unique to the record, data set title, alternate titles would be added here, Origin is where you select if the uh, record is going to be internal or external. Description, subject domain, subject keywords, published to data catalog. When you're creating a record, the default is not yet, so everything is hidden from the public view. Once everything is set and the record looks good, you simply toggle on the yes radio button, click on the submit button, and it's made readily available in the public end. Author information and data location information. Right here is what operates that blue button. The words access via, which you've seen in, within the blue button, are system generated. Therefore, the only thing that needs to be added is whatever should follow access via. In our case here with Dr. Otomus's record is simply NCBI gene expression omnibus. For Dr. Chen's record, which required an application, the word application would be put here. And for the final public view record we reviewed, it was via author, the word author would be put here. And down here in the third field would be the URL to whatever website or application or that HTML script that would create a uh, blank email auto-populated with the author's email address in the case that it was accessed via author. If you recall Dr. Atomus's record, he also had supplementary material and that was under other resources. And this is the URL that allowed you to go right to the article with the supplementary files on the left side. Access instructions and access restrictions. And this should all look very familiar. Study type, subject of study, equipment, software, data set file format, size, data set type year data collection started and data collection ended, subject genders, 
subject population age, these two fields would be where you would uh, be able to demonstrate where uh, the uh, geographic uh, study happened. And that is also where the final record we reviewed in the public and all of those detailed geographic uh, entries come from. Article citation, grants, the related data sets would be added here. Only need to uh, in, enter the unique ID of the record to which it was related. Now, if Dr. Atomus's uh, study was actually an external data catalog record, your URL for the public PubMed search would be here, and his name would be in local experts instead of under author. Then you go down to submit, and the record would be created. Again, until I toggle on that yes in publish view, it's not viewable in the public end. However, this is one of my favorite functions, view entry for this data set. It allows you to see what the record would look like in the public view. You can also test the click, clickability, make sure that everything is going to where they should go. Going back to edit data set, I would click on yes, go down to the submit button, and it's made available in the public view. Now for managed entities. There are 19 entities in this group. These metadata elements are special in that a change in any value within these entities will be reflected in all records that reference that value. In other words, if you find a typo in a subject domain term and correct it, the edit will be reflected in all records that include that term. Many of these elements within the Manage Related Entities group consist of multiple fields for information. So let's take a look at a few of them. I'm going down to Dr. Schuldiner's entry. And as you can see, there are five information fields here. Full name. The KID is essentially only for NYU use. If Dr. Schuldiner had an ORCID ID and we knew it, we could enter it, enter it here. If you recall that I hovered over Dr. Chen's name near the author in his record and was able to click on view profile, that, was where, that would be where that URL would be, and then email. We'll look at cited publications. This has three different information fields the actual citation, which is what appears, then the URL behind it, plus the DOI. And one more example, we'll take a look at awards. These are grants. This is four information fields, grant number or name, funding agency, funder type, and if there is an NIH reporter page for the study, that URL would be put here. One idiosyncrasy of the related entities is that a local expert or author has to exist before it can be used in a record. Therefore, the name has to be added to the local expert authority entity before beginning a new record. That said, we do add the values to all of the relevant related entities before working on a record because it suits our workflow. One main reason is that when creating a record, you can select the value from a pull-down menu instead of adding it on the fly, which reduces the risk of typos. And I'll demonstrate that with Dr. Harris's. This is not a published record yet. I'll go down to subject domain, click in the box, and it brings up a pull down menu. And let's just pick up dental materials. And it's added as easy as that. It's deleted 
easily as well. However, if we did want to add a term on the fly, it's as easy as clicking add new, which results in a pop-up menu. And it has all the fields necessary, the subject domain term, and then this would be the link data URI that would go along with it. That ends the online demo part and brings me to the final section of my presentation. And that's an overview of our procedure. For internal data sets, we read the entire article associated with the research. For external data sets, the websites are, review are reviewed. As now mentioned earlier, we developed two spreadsheet templates, one each for internal and external records, that mirror the metadata elements in the exact sequence they appear in the back end add a new data set function. The managed related entities are color coded in red for ease of identification. There are several benefits to using a spreadsheet. It facilitates collection of all metadata, including the URLs and all other details in a single document which streamlines the process. Values that already exist in related entities are easily identified, which reduces duplication of effort. Actually creating a new record is a simple matter of copying and pasting or selecting a term from a pull-down menu. For internal data sets, gaps in metadata are evident. So what do I mean by that? Well, we build the catalog record with the information from within the article associated with the data set. However, the articles don't necessarily include all of the possible metadata information. In those situations, we flag the omissions with blue question marks in the spreadsheet. Once the record has been created in the catalog, but not yet published, NAS sends the completed meta spreadsheet and screenshot of the public view to the author for review. This affords him or her the opportunity to suggest edits and provide any missing metadata. You're currently viewing a screenshot of the second page of a spreadsheet for an internal record. As you can see, the managed related entities are in red and missing data has been flagged with question marks or question marks and a word. This is a simple workflow diagram for internal data sets. We go from article to creating the template, to entering the managed related entities, create a record, send the template and the screenshot to the researcher. The researcher can review it, say everything looks fine, in which case we publish it. Or the researcher provides us with additional information or requests for editing. We do so and then publish it. That concludes my part of the presentation. Hopefully we've provided you with a fairly good understanding of the structure, functionality, and flexibility of the schema and software. Before I turn it back to Patty, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank both NYU and Pitt for their considerable efforts in improving the metadata and especially to the two developers who worked on implementing changes and updating the software. It's still a work in progress. And now back to Patty. Okay, so let's take a look at a few lessons learned. Teamwork is essential whether it was our library-wide team or our collaborators from other institutions. Sharing experiences and expertise is very enriching and I think produces a, a better service. I also wanna follow up on what Meg say, said and give a special shout out to the staff at the Health Sciences Library at NYU and staff at the Health Sciences Library at the University of Pittsburgh who have been with us since the beginning. We appreciate their expertise and their commitment to the project. You also need patience and perseverance. Most researchers we contact think the catalog is a great idea. However, some are too busy to contribute immediately. So this requires follow-up. Others who participate 
and are given a record to review sometimes need a reminder that we're waiting for their approval. So again, more follow-up. It has also been a benefit to have a metadata librarian with a science background and an ongoing curiosity and interest in science. I think this has helped in the creation of our data catalog records. And finally, since we are using open source, an open source solution, ongoing IT support is extremely important, both for maintaining and developing the software. If you would like to explore our catalog, there are a couple ways to access it, either through the direct URL, through the library website, if there's a link on the main page, or you can simply type in UMB data catalog in, Google, in a Google search and it'll pop right up. If you're using Google's data set search, you may run across links to our records since they do index our catalog. If you're interested in the software, we've included the link to GitHub, also to the documentation um, for the catalog and metadata, and then the DCC website. In a few minutes, I know we're gonna have a question and answer period, but if you think of um, something later on and wanna ask questions, please don't hesitate to contact one of us. This concludes our formal presentation. Na, Meg, and I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to hear about the UMB data catalog. And now I'm gonna hand it, hand it back to Miriam for the question and answer period. Great, thank you all so very much. This has been really informative and it was really wonderful to see that data catalog. Uh, speaking as a cataloger, I was very, very excited to see it. So everybody, this is now time for question and answers. So please feel free to enter any questions you have into the questions box and our presenters will, uh, will do their very best to answer them. Meg, quick, I think this is a question for you. Um, I, you may have mentioned this, but are changes to the records uh, instantaneous or do you have like a system refresh schedule? No, they're instantaneous. Uh, okay. There are times where we have to ask uh, for the catalog to be re-indexed, but they're instantaneous. Okay. Okay, we've got a, a question here and a comment. The person says, thank you very much. Great accomplishment on the catalog. And then there's a question here. Are the DOIs ones that were minted by the publisher or do you do your own DOI minting? No, they're, they're by the publisher. Okay. And then as far as the external and internal records and the, the fact that some researchers require an application, is that mostly an internal record thing or do you external uh, records also require an application? No, the, um, well, that's a good question. They don't require an application in terms of our record, but getting, but once you get to the website, they can require quite a, quite a few different things. And we try to include those requirements sometimes in the description of the external record to warn people that you need to do this, that, or the other thing. Um, but uh, external records, it depends upon the uh, external website and the data that's stored there, what's required. Uh, with the OII, I think there are uh, even more uh, requirements than we put under access instructions and restrictions. But that information is on the external website for the data set. Okay. Next question, are, are, are managed entities only created through the form interface? Not sure I understand that. You can do it through managed uh, related entities or you can do it on the fly. Uh, and what we do is we enter them via the managed related entities and that allows us to pull it from that pull down menu. I hope okay. that answers the question. Okay, next up, where did you say you obtained the authoritative vocabulary for the subject terms? 
Oh, there are medical subject headings or Library of Congress. We have a social work, school of social work here, uh, which have data sets in our data catalog. And uh, often we need to use the Library of Congress for them. Um, and, but we're mostly clinical, so usually MeSH subject head, the MeSH headings uh, suffice for the rest of them. Okay. Another person asked, I would like to receive a little more clarification on the differences between internal and external data sets. Yeah, uh, that's not that's not an unusual question. And we do have hybrids, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but the external data sets are usually either government, like Medicare or Medicaid or government agencies data sets. Or there are large clinical studies, such as the Osteoarthritis Initiative, SEER, MESA, there's a whole bunch of them. And um, they're external to us. We didn't generate them from our research. They were generated from studies that were done, either multi-institutional studies or usually multi-institutional studies or government agencies. So those are, tend to be external. The ones that are internal are the ones that are done by our researchers uh, on a specific uh, question uh, and the, their research generated a data, data set. And those are the internal ones. Okay. Are there batch load options for managed entities? Ooh, I don't think so. Mm. Um, we add them as we need them. Uh, and I have not heard of any kind of batch load uh, opportunity, although uh, I won't say that there isn't. I, we have not used them. It okay. might be possible if you have an uh, internal capa capacity like uh, programmer or developer, they can do it from the back end. Okay. Now, I think this might be a question for you. What is, what is the biggest challenge with, with outreach? Was there a particular concern that came up with dealing with the researchers or working with them that, um, that, that kind of came up over and over again? Yes, but uh, it's uh, mostly uh, the uh, individual researchers because they are so busy and our researchers are more like forward looking. Uh, once they've done the projects, they don't want to go back to have anything to do with it anymore. Uh, so that would be a challenge. And uh, other challenges, uh, including de-identification, right? To spend time to do all that, you know, again, takes their time. But what we find out, it's, it's not about the identification, it's about the time. Bottom line is they don't want to spend the time on that. So it, it, it takes uh, uh, several times, uh, several outreach to persuade. Um, but as I said, the good news is now the data are mandated to be open. So in a lot of uh, ways, uh, they, it's baked in their uh, mindset right now. So things are getting better, but uh, still uh, a lot of efforts there. Great, thank you. And then just, this is my own question here, um, uh, coming from a non-medical library background, can you talk a little bit more about the function of your bioinformationist? The um, bioinformationist works with our researchers and talks about um, data management, he also uh, works with researchers on data analysis and data wrangling. Um, and he also will do classes and individual consultations. Okay, great. Thank you. And then one more question, Meg, this might be for you. When you add a subject domain term, on the, the back end for the data catalog. Yeah. Can you can you just make up that term or does it have to kind of correspond with MeSH and LC? No, the subject domain is uh, authoritative. So they're okay. either MeSH or LC, but the keywords uh, don't have to be authoritative. We try to stick with the authority uh, vocabulary, but um, there are times where we can't because uh, uh, they're acronyms or something that uh, anyone who would be in that uh, 
realm of the subject matter would use, and it's not an authoritative term. And we want to be the catalog records to be able to be findable as quickly as possible. So we do add non-authoritative terms when we think it's it's appropriate. Okay, great, thank you. And then we've got time for one more question. Um, this this regards the applications that some of the researchers yes. require. What, what exactly, what are some of the reasons that they would require an application? Is it just well, to control like I, how many? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doctor, we have a couple of ones. Dr. Chen's um, cholera vaccine record, that was actually funded by a pharma company called Paxvax. And they actually own the data. And he was very kind uh, to uh, tell us that he would act as an intermediary uh, if somebody was interested in accessing that data. We also have a School of Dentistry faculty member who wanted uh, an application because he did not, he wanted somebody who was serious enough to take the time to complete an application. He didn't want just somebody to say, can I have ac access? Now the one that I showed you in the Pharmaceutical Research Computing Center, they required it, that's their application and they provided us with a URL. So that was not generated by our bioinformationist. Uh, and they require it because uh, it's, uh, the data sets are limited. Uh, they have restricted access and uh, they want the uh, completion of an application before uh, continuing in, in discussion with whoever wants access. Great, thank you so much. I think that's it for our questions. We have a few questions remaining, so we'll make sure that those are archived and our presenters have kindly offered to answer any remaining questions in writing after the webinar. So those answers will be emailed to our attendees when we send out the slides and the recording. We're glad that you could all be with us today. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording. You now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That information will also be in the email. Thanks again to our presenters, Megan Dalbagliveau, Patricia Heingardner, and Na Lin. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Dana Hanford and Catherine Valick, and to Alana Warren from the ELEX office. The support they provide makes it possible for us to present these webinars. ELEX has other continuing education events coming up. Please see the ELEX website to register or find more information on these events. ELEX also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be November 19th on digital skill building. Please check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all for joining us today, and this concludes our session.